My name is Harlan Briggs, and this happened to me in August of 1997. Back then, I was working as a ranger in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Raised in those hills, thought I knew every damn trail like the back of my hand. My partner was old-timer named Clem, grizzled as a bear and twice as ornery. We mainly dealt with the usual. Litter bugs, drunk hikers, the occasional bear sighting. One late summer morning, Clem and I got a call so strange it stuck with me all these years. Report came from a couple at the Albright Grove trailhead. They swore up and down they'd stumbled across a human skeleton, picked clean like a Thanksgiving turkey. We figured it was a prank, or more likely, folks mistaking some bear-gnawed animal bones for human remains. Clem grumbled about tourists the whole drive up the winding mountain road. But when we reached the spot, even Clem couldn't hide his unease. It was human, all right. The strangest part weren't the bones themselves, scattered and weathered, but how they were arranged. They'd been carefully laid out in a rough circle around the base of an ancient oak tree, almost ceremonial. It sent a shiver down my spine. Clem radioed it in, his voice gruff. We marked the scene and waited for the techs and forensics to arrive. Things got weirder after that. In the week that followed, more skeletal remains were found in that same area. None recent, all showing that same unsettling pattern. Word spread like wildfire through the ranger stations, but HQ dismissed it as a series of old, unreported deaths. People getting lost in the backcountry wasn't unheard of. Still, a nagging feeling settled over me. Something about those bones whispered of a different kind of darkness. Then it got personal. A fellow ranger named Jessup vanished without a trace. He'd been on a solo patrol and never came back. Search parties scoured the woods and all we found was his mangled backpack and a pool of blood at a remote campsite. No body, no sign of animal attack, nothing that made a lick of sense. That's when the rumors began. Hushed whispers about old Cherokee legends, about a monstrous shadowy creature lurking in the forgotten corners of the Smokies, a hunter of men. Clem dismissed it all as superstition. But that same night, I was on watch and I swear on my mother's grave, I saw it. I had been jolted awake by the frantic barking of the station dogs. Something was out there. My heart pounded in my chest as I stepped out onto the porch, rifle in hand. The woods were deathly silent, and the hair on the back of my neck stood on end. That's when I noticed the eyes, two glowing orbs in the darkness, floating high above the trees. I stumbled backwards, tripping over a chair. The creature let out a low, guttural growl that echoed across the clearing. It sounded impossibly large, impossibly close. Headlights flashed through the trees as a ranger truck screeched to a halt. The eyes vanished, and the creature, whatever it was, melted back into the darkness. When the other rangers arrived, they found me shaken and mumbling. No sign of the creature, hell, no sign of anything other than my own panicked footprints in the dew-covered grass. They tried to reassure me, chalking it up to overwork and a vivid imagination. But I knew what I'd seen, and I knew somehow that Jessup wasn't the last to disappear. I started carrying my rifle everywhere, even off-duty. I jumped at every creaking tree limb, every rustle in the underbrush. My sleep was a patchwork of nightmares where I was the deer, the creature a towering, relentless hunter always closing in. My relationship with Anya, a girl from town, crumbled under the pressure. I tried to explain, but who could believe such a story? The killings continued. Victims always alone, always in the most desolate parts of the park. No bodies, just fragments of bone carefully arranged. The press got wind of it, and soon the Smokies were awash in reporters, true crime nuts, and amateur monster hunters. Clem and I got pulled into the official investigation, but the higher-ups treated us like we were spreading ghost stories. One night, camped out near the site of Jessup's disappearance, Clem finally cracked. He confessed that he'd seen it too. A fleeting glimpse of a massive elongated form with glowing eyes and a mouth full of impossibly long teeth. We swore a pact. If we crossed paths with that creature again, we weren't running. The following afternoon, we got our chance. There'd been another discovery. Another ring of bones. We staked out a nearby ridge, rifles loaded, nerves a jangle. As the last light faded and the woods were swallowed by shadow, it appeared. 
The creature stepped out from the trees like a figure from a nightmare. It was taller than any man had a right to be, its limbs impossibly thin, its skin a mottled greenish-black that blended seamlessly with the surrounding darkness. The eyes. Lord. Those eyes burned with that same malevolent light I'd seen outside the station. We raised our rifles and fired. The gunshots echoed through the forest, loud and deafening. The creature staggered under the impact, a roar shattering the stillness. It didn't bleed, it simply snarled and lunged for us. Clem had time for one more shot before it reached him, sending the long-limbed form crashing into the underbrush. Scrambling for cover behind a fallen log, I reloaded, my heart a frantic drumbeat in my ears. The creature wasn't dead, but it seemed dazed, shaking its head in a way that sent a jolt of unease through me. We'd hurt it, maybe even wounded it, but that only seemed to make it all the more furious. As the creature regrouped, we retreated, moving through the trees with the desperation of cornered animals. Ahead, I recognized a faint trail leading toward an abandoned fire tower. We sprinted for it, knowing the flimsy structure offered little real protection, but at that moment, height was our only advantage. The fire tower was a relic from another era, a rusted metal skeleton jutting defiantly above the tree line. Clem scrambled up the ladder first, his grunts of exertion echoing in the tense silence. I followed, the rungs cold against my clammy palms. Just as I reached the platform, I heard the crash of the creature tearing through the underbrush. We crouched at the top of the tower, peering desperately over the edge. The creature circled the structure, its eyes fixed on our precarious perch. Clem muttered a curse under his breath as he chambered another round. Minutes stretched into an eternity as we waited, sweat slick on our faces, praying for a rescue that might never come. Then, something changed. The creature stopped its agitated pacing. It stood motionless, head tilted as if listening, its form silhouetted against the moonlit sky. Suddenly a different sound cut through the night, the high-pitched wail of sirens. Red and blue lights flashed through the trees, approaching rapidly. The creature turned and slinked away into the darkness, disappearing with astonishing speed. Clem and I sagged in relief, a wave of exhaustion washing over us. A few agonizing hours later, the cavalry arrived. Search parties with flashlights fanned out, cautiously combing the forest. They found traces, shredded brush, dark splashes that we didn't need to identify. But of the creature, there was no sign. When dawn finally broke, it cast a weak, wan light over the scene of our ordeal. Official investigators arrived, suits and scientists replacing flashlights and uniforms. They surveyed the area, took samples, asked endless questions. The whole time, Clem and I stood silently, exchanging grim looks. We knew what they were thinking. Two traumatized rangers spooked by a bear or a mountain lion, seeing monsters in the shadows. To them, we were either fools or liars. The aftermath was a blur. Medical leave, mandatory psych evaluations, the endless whispers that followed us through the park. We were the rangers who'd cracked, the ones who'd seen something they couldn't explain. The press got a hold of the story, embellished and distorted it until it became unrecognizable. Monster of the Smokies, they called it. I started carrying a flask, drowning out the nightmares with cheap whiskey. Anya showed up one night, bags packed, and walked out with a pitying glance I'll never forget. Eventually, the story died down. The official explanation was a series of unfortunate accidents, animal attacks misidentified in the panic. Case closed. The park promoted Clem to desk duty and quietly offered me early retirement. I took it left the mountains I once loved, drifted from town to town, never staying long, tried to find work that wasn't in law enforcement, that didn't involve remote locations, but the stigma clung to me. Sometimes, even now, I catch a glimpse of movement out of the corner of my eye, a flicker of shadow behind a dumpster, an elongated shape slipping between the trees at the edge of a city park. My heart thuds in my chest, and that old bone-deep terror surges through me, most days I can tell myself it's nothing, PTSD rearing its ugly head. But a creeping, insidious part of me knows the truth. Maybe the Smokies weren't the first place that creature stalked the land. Maybe they won't be the last. Maybe it's smarter now, 
more cautious. Sometimes I hear those sirens in my sleep. Clem died a few years back. Heart attack, they said. Maybe it finally got to him, or maybe it was just the weight of what we saw. I keep my gun loaded, my curtains drawn. Every creak of the floorboards, every rustle of leaves outside my window. Is it the wind, or something far worse waiting in the darkness? They say time heals all wounds. If that's true, it means there are wounds this world doesn't know how to fix. I've spent a lifetime watching over my shoulder, waiting for those glowing eyes to find me again. Some nights, I think they already have. My name is Callie Whitman, and this happened to me in October of 2012. I'm a ranger for Sequoia National Park, been one since college. Love the trees, the open sky, all that good stuff. Makes up for the low pay and tourists who think feeding wild animals is a good idea. Late one afternoon, I got a call over the radio about a group of hikers who hadn't returned from the Redwood Canyon Trail. They were two couples from Germany, experienced outdoorsy types going off the official path for some more remote exploration. I grabbed one of the park ATVs and headed out. It was nearly dusk when I reached their last known location. Their backpacks were dumped beside a stream camera, supplies, the works just lying there. But no sign of the people. That felt wrong. Even if they got turned around, you don't just ditch your gear for the bears to enjoy. I drew my gun, scanning the rapidly darkening woods. Suddenly a horrible cry rang out from deeper in the trees. Sounded human, but with an undercurrent of something else. Raw, desperate, and cut short in a terrifying, wet gurgle. My blood ran cold. I moved towards the sound, pistol ready. Rounding a bend, I saw, well, I'm still not sure exactly what. One of the hikers, a woman, half sprawled on the ground, clothes torn open. Blood spattered everywhere, but the amount seemed impossible. I didn't see any wounds as such, more like she'd been ripped apart from the inside out. Then, the trees behind her rustled. Out of the shadows stepped the biggest damn bear I'd ever seen. It towered over me on its hind legs, easily eight feet tall. Fur not brown, but a sickly mottled gray-green, hanging loose like it was half-rotted. Its eyes. They were yellow and wide, with slitted pupils like a snake's, and burning with a hunger that had nothing to do with just needing a meal. My first shot hit its center mass, sent the creature staggering. Second shot tore through its shoulder. Thing roared the sound shaking leaves off the trees, and charged on all fours. I emptied the entire clip into it. Blood sprayed, its fur was blasted clear off in patches, but it didn't stop. It hurtled towards me, a monstrous, unstoppable wall of muscle and rage. I ducked as it lunged overhead, the stink of its breath hot on my neck. It hit a tree trunk, hard enough to crack the bark, and I whirled, grabbing for my backup handgun. My fingers fumbled, it fell into the damp leaves, and the creature was on me again, a whirlwind of teeth and claws. I screamed, throwing up my arms as its paw slammed into my side. Pain exploded, then a weird feeling like my whole body was being jerked sideways. I realized with a jolt that it had caught my gun belt, was dragging me along the ground. I kicked at its legs, desperately reached back for anything to grab hold of. My fingers closed around a thick root just in time. The monster yanked, my shoulders screaming in protest but I held on, feet digging into the dirt. The tug of war lasted for agonizing seconds, the creature roaring, drool, dripping from its monstrous jaws. Then, with a sickening tear, my belt ripped along with a whole chunk of my uniform. The creature stumbled, momentarily distracted, and I scrambled back, scrambling for my dropped pistol among the leaves. I found it just as the beast turned, its yellow eyes narrowing as it focused on me anew. It let out a guttural snarl and charged. I fired blindly, once, twice, three times. I heard a wet, thudding sound, and it stumbled, faltering mid-stride. I aimed again, finger tightening on the trigger, and then... nothing. The gun clicked empty. I stared in horror as the creature slowly straightened, those terrible eyes fixed on me. There wasn't enough time to reload. It moved with a surprising, loping speed blurring towards me across the ground. I closed my eyes, then threw up an arm as its claws raked down. Sharp pain, a burst of searing heat, and then... Silence? 
I opened my eyes. The creature was gone. Slowly, cautiously, I stood. My arm burned like fire and blood soaked my sleeve. I glanced down and immediately wished I hadn't. Three deep gashes ran down to the bone and I could see something shiny and white within them. My vision swam, my stomach threatening to heave up what little lunch I'd had. I stumbled in the direction of the trail, clutching the ragged edges of my shirt around the wounds. Every few steps the world would tilt and spin. I must have passed out at some point, because the next thing I remember is waking up under a dazzling spotlight in the back of a helicopter. Medics hovered around me, their voices distorted and far away. I tried to explain what had happened, but the words wouldn't form right. They kept saying, bear, attack, nodding, looking at my wounds like this was all normal. The next few days were a blur of hospital beds and disbelieving park staff. I told them everything I remembered, but they only looked concerned and muttered things like trauma and hallucinations. Rangers combed the area where the attack happened. No sign of the creature, no bodies of the other hikers. My gun belt was found torn to shreds, but no gun. The doctors patched me up as best they could, but the wounds across my arm were deep. They left angry, jagged scars and a lingering weakness that made it hard to grip my gun properly, or even lift heavy gear. After a month, they released me with a long list of physical therapy appointments, and a note that I was on light duty for the foreseeable future. I moved back into my little cabin nestled on the edge of the park. It felt emptier than usual, even with my old dog Rusty for company. Nightmares plagued me, the crushing weight of the creature, its fetid breath, those terrible eyes. I started leaving the lights on even when I slept, gun tucked under my pillow. News of the attack made the local papers. I got a few calls from reporters, all wanting the scoop on the monstrous bear. But I refused to talk. The official ranger's report chalked the whole thing up to a freak encounter with a bear that must have been rabid or territorial or something. The higher-ups seemed all too eager to close the case and hush it up. I tried to go back to work, to pretend everything was normal. But it wasn't. The forest felt different. Every creak of a branch, every rustle of leaves had me whirling around, fingers hovering over my weapon. My fellow rangers watched me with worried eyes, and I began getting mostly desk assignments, filing paperwork instead of patrolling the wilds. It graded. I'd chosen this life for the freedom of it, the thrill of being out in the untamed wilderness. Now the idea of venturing into the trees filled me with an unshakable dread. My determination warred with a constant simmering fear. I started spending my days off alone, hiking short trails closer to park boundaries, trying to desensitize myself. Rusty trotted by my side, a furry, growling security blanket. Little by little, that knot of anxiety loosened. Not gone, never fully gone, but manageable. Then one afternoon, everything changed. I was out on a well-traveled trail, one of those wide, graveled affairs that tourists with strollers flock to. Rusty was ahead sniffing in the undergrowth, when I noticed something odd, a glint of metal half buried in the dirt. I bent down and unearthed a mangled pair of eyeglasses, German make from the look of them. My heart sank. This was close to where the hikers had disappeared. I shoved the glasses in my pocket, marking the spot on my GPS, and called the base camp. The search team went in hard this time, dogs, thermal imaging, the whole nine yards. Two days later, they made a grim discovery in a hidden ravine. The bodies of three of the hikers, or what was left of them. The cause of death was brutally clear. Word got back to me. They'd been torn apart just like that first victim, and like something had been chewing on the bones. Officially, those deaths were added to the bear attack file. But now there was a new directive. Bring in professional wildlife trappers. Tranquilize the creature. And relocate it. If it was even a bear... I watched the trappers set up near where I'd found the glasses. Huge metal cages baited with roadkill, cameras rigged up everywhere. They told me to stay away, that the area was off limits. I agreed, but my nights became restless again. It was out there, still hunting, and they were going to bring it in closer. It happened a week later. I was sitting in my cabin trying to ignore the heavy rain pounding the roof when my phone buzzed with an emergency alert. The creature had taken the bait. It was in one of the cages, thrashing and raging, and the trappers were en route to sedate it. They wanted me there, the one who had previous experience. 
I couldn't ignore the order, especially not with how those hikers' remains had been found. With a sense of grim determination, I got into my truck, Rusty whining nervously in the passenger seat. When I reached the site, it was chaos. Searchlights pierced the darkness, rain lashed down, shouts carried on the wind. The metal cage looked dented, its bars bent. Whatever was inside wasn't just big, it was monstrously strong. The trappers huddled nearby, rifles loaded with trank darts. Then, I saw it. A hulking shape emerged from the shadows, illuminated for a brief moment as it passed under a spotlight. That loose, rotting fur, the impossibly long limbs, those glowing eyes. My stomach lurched, but I forced back the bile. I couldn't back down now. Whitman, stay with the group, yelled one of the trappers. I ignored him, moving cautiously toward the cage. Rusty snarled, hackles raised, straining at his leash. It smelled me, knew what I was. A low, guttural growl emanated from the cage. I stopped a few feet away, gun raised. Not my service weapon. This was my dad's old hunting rifle. More power behind it. Let me get a clear shot, I yelled over the roaring wind. The trappers glanced at each other, hesitating. Then, as if sensing weakness, the creature lunged at the bars with a deafening clang. One trapper swore and fired a dart. It bounced harmlessly off the matted fur. It roared in fury and lunged again. Time seemed to slow. The metal bars shrieked and buckled. I saw the trappers' faces pale. This wasn't going to hold for long. I took aim, squeezing the trigger. The gunshot echoed through the night. The creature staggered and a low, choking sound emerged from its throat. I fired again, and again. It slumped back, a dark mass heaving and twitching within the cage. The trappers finally came to their senses, swarming closer and firing trank after trank until the creature went limp. Silence fell, except for the drumming rain. I lowered the rifle, my hands shaking. I had done it, or so I thought. But as I approached the cage, the creature's eyes snapped open, burning with malevolent fury. It was playing dead. My shout of warning was too late. The weakened bars gave way with a final mangled groan. The creature burst forth, a whirlwind of claws and teeth and impossible speed. It snatched one of the trappers, a sickening crunch carried on the wind, and then vanished back into the darkness. The aftermath was a blur of panicked shouts, searchlights cutting wildly, and the barking of the tracking dogs let loose from their leashes. I stumbled back to my truck, rusty whimpering as I shoved him inside. I had to get out of there, away from this place. But where do you go when the monsters are real, and the refuge of the wilderness is tainted with blood and death? My name is Maya Ortiz, and this happened to me in August of 2008. I've been a park ranger in Zion National Park, Utah, for nearly a decade now. Love the work, love the views. Those red rock canyons never get old. Happily married, one kid who's the light of my life. That morning started like any other. I pulled on my gear, grabbed my radio, and got the dispatch call about an overdue solo hiker. Guy named Wayne, mid-50s out from California for some spiritual journey into the desert. That kind of thing. Found his car at the trailhead for the Hidden Canyon Trail. Seemed like a fairly easy mission. The trail wasn't too long, and he was experienced from what his buddies said on the call-in report. I set out around 10 a.m., the sun already baking the trail into an oven. Had my usual water supplies, just in case, but I should have packed more. Figured by noon I'd find Wayne, maybe a bit sunburnt, sheepishly admitting to losing track of time, and I'd escort him back safe and sound. I was wrong. The further in I went, the narrower the canyon walls got, the sunlight barely poking through. Place has an otherworldly feel about it, kind of desolate beauty that grabs hold of you. Gave me goosebumps, but I ignored it. After a while, I stumbled upon Wayne's backpack, discarded in a patch of shade where the trail twisted around a sheer rock face. No sign of the man himself. A chill ran down my spine. You don't ditch your survival gear in the desert, not unless something's seriously wrong. Radio buzzed in my pocket, base camp checking in. I updated them, the worry seeping into my voice. They sent a backup team, 
said they'd be there by nightfall. That was hours away. I had to keep going on my own. The trail wound deeper into that sunless canyon, found traces of scuffled boots, few drops of blood on the rocks. Something spooked Wayne, made him rush. But what? I holstered my sidearm, a sense of dread settling in my stomach. The silence felt heavy, oppressive. Should have been birdsong, rustle of lizards, usual desert sounds. But nothing. It was nearly sunset when I emerged into a sort of natural amphitheater in the canyon, hidden from sight unless you were practically on top of it. That's where I saw them, not just Wayne. Five other bodies, half stripped of clothes, torn and bloody like they'd been mauled by a wild animal. And Wayne, still barely alive, face pale as death, eyes staring wide, in absolute terror. And then I saw what he'd been looking at. It emerged from the shadows, a monstrous silhouette against the fading sunlight. At first I thought it was a bear, a monstrously huge one, but as it reared up, I saw it walk on two legs. This thing was easily eight feet tall, covered in matted gray-black fur, with a head that was... wrong, snout too long, jaw hanging in a way that reminded me uncomfortably of a hungry wolf. It took a step towards me, and I caught a whiff of something foul, like rotting meat and something sulfurous. Those yellow eyes locked on mine, full of malice I'd never seen in any creature. No animal I'd ever learned about behaved like this. I yelled for Wayne, but his voice was barely a whisper. Run, he croaked. It hunts. That's when the creature charged. I sprinted toward the exit of the amphitheater, scrambling up the canyon walls with a desperation I didn't know I possessed. I heard a bellow of rage behind me, snarls that made my blood run cold. Whatever this thing was, it was fast. I reached the top of the ridge just as the sun dipped below the horizon, plunging the canyon into darkness. The creature lunged, but I hurled myself down the other side, tumbling and crashing through the underbrush. It roared in frustration, echoing through the canyons. I didn't stop running, didn't look back. I heard it scrambling somewhere above, the sound of stone clattering. Thorns tore at my clothes and skin, but I ignored the pain. My lungs burned, my legs screamed for mercy, but I pushed on. If that thing caught me, I was dead. I had to reach the main trail, reach open ground. Maybe then I had a chance. Somewhere above, the creature growled and howled. It was flanking me, moving through the brush a hell of a lot faster than any human could. The sound of its claws scraping against the rock face sent shivers down my spine. We were playing a twisted game of predator and prey, and I was losing. Then, I heard it. The unmistakable rumble of an ATV. Backup had arrived. I screamed, waving my arms frantically, trying to signal my position. A moment later, a searchlight cut through the darkness, blinding me. Ranger Ortiz! It was Carter, my partner, his voice tense. I stumbled toward the sound and the light, collapsing to my knees when I reached the edge of the brush. Carter and another ranger, Gwen, jumped off the ATV and rushed over, shining flashlights on my torn clothing and bloodied legs. "'What the hell happened?' Carter exclaimed. "'Where's that damn hiker?' I pointed a shaking hand back up the ridge. "'Hidden canyon. Monster. It killed everyone.' They exchanged a worried glance. Shock must have been setting in, making me talk crazy. Just then, we heard a chilling snarl. It came from above, from the blackness at the top of the ridge. The creature stepped into the beams of the flashlight, its monstrous form illuminated against the night sky. I saw Carter and Gwen stiffen, their training momentarily replaced by primal fear. It howled again, a sound that ripped through the desert silence. Then it pounced, moving with impossible speed. I shoved Carter aside just as the creature landed in the space I'd occupied a second before. Carter stumbled and fired a shotgun blast, but the creature dodged a streak of fur disappearing into the brush. Gwen raised her own weapon and fired, her voice tense but steady. We need more firepower, Carter. Call it in. I tried to catch my breath, my mind reeling. The creature was real. All those stories whispered in ranger camps about things not quite right, things seen out of the corner of your eye deep in the backcountry. They weren't campfire tales. They were truth. The radio crackled with voices, backup teams converging on our position, armed to the teeth. Searchlights swept the ridges and canyon openings, tracking any sign of movement. 
It felt like a war zone. They asked me what I'd seen, but words failed. How do you describe the stuff of nightmares? The wait was excruciating. The silence echoed, broken only by the rasp of our breathing and the occasional report over the radio. We knew the creature was out there, watching, waiting for the opportune moment to attack. By dawn, the park was swarming with personnel SWAT teams, helicopters buzzing overhead, wildlife specialists setting traps baited with chunks of raw meat. The place looked less like a national park and more like a hunting ground. But the creature was nowhere to be found. They collected the bodies, sealed off the canyon. Official line was a mountain lion attack, maybe a rabid one to explain the unusual aspects. The truth was classified, and I was told to keep my mouth shut for the sake of public safety. That was the easy part. Hard part was facing the fact that something out of my worst nightmares now existed in my waking hours. Back at the ranger station, we all debriefed, trying to make sense of the impossible. Wildlife experts scoffed. Such a creature couldn't exist. Yet I knew what I had seen, what was still out there, lurking in the shadows. The higher-ups made the call. The Zion backcountry was too dangerous. Sections of the park were permanently shut down, including that hidden canyon the creature claimed as its twisted hunting ground. I stayed on for another year or so. They offered a desk job, but I couldn't face being cooped up, knowing what was out there. I moved the family, found quieter work at a smaller park. But even here, sometimes, when I walk the trails on quiet evenings, I swear I feel eyes on me from the deepest part of the woods, those cold yellow eyes. The hunt, I think, never truly ends. The news reports pop up from time to time, sightings in remote corners, a half-eaten animal carcass that doesn't fit any predator profile, campers gone missing without a single trace, never any proof, never enough to reopen the case of Zion. Just whispers and the growing knowledge that we aren't alone out there. I tell myself the creature won't follow me, that it's tied to that canyon. But deep down, a part of me knows that's no guarantee. The wilderness was my sanctuary, and it betrayed me. It showed me that there are monstrous things out there, things that go bump in the night, and sometimes, sometimes they step into the light, bearing teeth and claws and those terrible eyes that see you not as a person, but as prey. My name is Eli Campbell, and this happened to me in October of 2010. I've been a park ranger in the Grand Canyon National Park for just about all my life. Love being out here. Grew up running around these rocks, probably know them better than my own backyard. That fall, things started to feel off. Wasn't just the usual nonsense, careless tourists snapping selfies too close to the edge, usual stuff. No, it was something in the air. A sense of wrongness hanging heavy over the canyon. Started with the whispers from other rangers, then from the hikers returning wide-eyed from the backcountry. Talk of strange noises at night, a feeling of being watched, the sense that something wasn't right out there. I didn't take it too seriously at first, chalked it up to overactive imaginations and folks getting spooked by the solitude. But then the disappearances started. Not a lot, mind you, just enough to put everyone on edge. One lone hiker here, a couple there, no trace left behind. The higher-ups claimed it was folks falling, getting lost in flash floods, the usual explanations. But something in my gut told me different. One afternoon, I was patrolling a stretch of the South Rim when I noticed a set of tracks that set my teeth on edge. They weren't human, weren't from an animal I recognized. They were huge, each print the size of my face, and something about their gait suggested massive power. There was an odd intelligence to the way they were placed, too, like whatever made them was sizing up the trail. I followed the tracks as long as I could before they disappeared down into the canyon depths. Went back to the station and tried to report it, but my supervisor, old Jimbo, just patted me on the shoulder. Too much sun, Eli, he chuckled. Figures. But I couldn't shake that feeling. Something was out there. Weeks turned into months, and the disappearances continued. I started taking hikes down the trails alone, searching for any sign of what was happening. One crisp morning in December, I found it. 
Deep in the canyon, I stumbled upon a cave tucked away in a side ravine. Inside, it smelled of rotten meat and something muskier, more primal. Littered across the floor were bones. Animals, sure, but also others. Too big and strangely shaped to be deer or elk. That's when I saw it, the creature, lurking in the cave's dark recesses. It must have been twelve feet tall, easily, its form a grotesque blend of man and beast. Massive shoulders covered in thick brown fur, claws like hunting knives at the end of long, muscular arms. But the worst part was its face, like a bear's only warped, elongated, and its eyes... God, I'd never seen eyes like that. Deep crimson, burning with a chilling intelligence. For a moment, we just stared at each other, the silence broken only by my hammering pulse. Then it let out a guttural growl that echoed off the cave walls. I scrambled back, tripping over rocks, never taking my eyes off the creature as it slowly lumbered out of the shadows. I ran. Every instinct screamed at me to get out of that canyon. The creature was gaining fast. I could hear its ragged breath behind me. My heart threatened to burst from my chest. My legs burned with exertion. Just when I thought I couldn't take another step, I saw the trail above. I launched myself up the last stretch of rocky ascent, scrambling onto the path bathed in the fading afternoon light. I looked back at the canyon below. The creature had stopped at the edge of the tree line, and for a long, terrifying moment our eyes met. Then, as if deciding I wasn't worth the chase, it turned and disappeared back into the shadows. I stumbled back to the station, babbling my story to a disbelieving Jimbo. He just shook his head, called me over to his old dusty computer to show me photos of black bears and sunstroke warnings. Said it was the stress, all those missing person cases getting to me. He was wrong, of course. In the months after my encounter, the disappearances continued, the search teams turning up nothing. Some people suspected me, whispers following me around the park. Crazy Eli, they called me. Didn't much care. I knew what I saw. Still no. Sometimes, on long nights when the wind whispers through the canyon, I swear I can smell that cave again, hear those heavy footsteps in the dark, the creatures still out there. A month ago, they found Jimbo's body down one of the ravines, ripped apart. No official cause, of course, but I knew. The creature had finally come for him. People called it a freak accident, an animal attack. I said nothing. After all, who would believe me? My name is Callie Simmons, and this happened to me in October of 2011. I've been with the National Park Service for a few years now, and I still get that wide-eyed wonder when I'm deep in the woods. I chose Redwood National Park specifically. Who doesn't love the giant trees? Something about them makes you feel small and ancient all at once. Most days, it's peaceful. The usual ranger stuff of maintaining trails, the occasional lost hiker, ecological surveys. It all started with the Richardsons. Mom, dad, two teenage kids, your typical American family, here to take over Poe's selfies and get some mild exercise on a designated trail. Only they never made it to the trail's end. Initially, it seemed routine. Delayed by a flat tire, maybe wandered a bit off the path. Two days turned into five, and the search expanded. No trace, not a backpack or an energy bar wrapper, nothing. I was part of the expanded search crew. You get used to a certain kind of desolation in the wilderness, the vastness that can swallow you whole. That week it was different. The woods felt heavy, watchful, like they were holding their breath. We spent days combing through the thick undergrowth and scanning the towering treetops, our calls echoing unanswered against the ancient trunks of the redwoods. And that's when the whispers started. Other searchers, muttering about odd sounds, movement just out of sight, and a chilling feeling of being watched. Old habits die hard. I chalked it up to exhaustion and nerves fraying under the pressure. But then came the Avery incident. Avery was my partner, a seasoned ranger with a steady hand and a dry sense of humor. Solid, the kind of person you'd want at your side in a crisis. We split up to cover more ground. Hours later, his panicked voice crackled over the radio. Callie, something's here. It's huge. Oh, God. His cry was cut short by a chilling, inhuman snarl and the abrupt silence of a dead radio. 
I sprinted through the trees guided by the terror in his last transmission. The forest closed in around me, the redwoods seeming to block out the late afternoon sun, casting the area in an eerie twilight. When I found him, or what was left of him, the full horror of the situation hit me with bone-jarring clarity. Avery wasn't torn apart like a bear attack. His body had been... disassembled. His limbs were wrenched away at impossible angles, his shattered bones jutting obscenely through his shredded uniform. And everywhere was blood, splattered across the ferns and up the bark of the trees like some macabre artwork. I gagged but forced myself to examine the scene. There were tracks pressed into the soft earth, far too large for any bear or cougar, clawed and vaguely humanoid in their shape. Officially, they listed Avery's death as an animal attack, some freak of nature we'd never documented before. But I knew. We all knew. Something was lurking out there, hunting us. In the weeks that followed, an unspoken agreement settled over our camp. We moved in groups, armed with rifles and a lingering dread that settled beneath our ribs. There were more disappearances. A pair of college students from a nearby campsite, a lone conservation officer who ventured off the beaten path. Each time we'd find nothing but those massive footprints and the same gruesome spatter of blood. Then it was my turn. I was with a crew marking trees for ecological surveys when I saw it. A flash of movement out of the corner of my eye, a towering silhouette disappearing behind a tangle of ferns. And that's when the forest seemed to explode into chaos. My team scattered, their shouts echoing through the trees. I saw a blur of matted, dark fur, and then something slammed into me, sending me sprawling to the ground. The force of the impact knocked the breath from my lungs. I scrambled backwards, fumbling for my rifle, but the figure was already looming over me. Everything about it was wrong. It stood at least eight feet tall, even hunched over. Its arms were impossibly long, ending in wicked claws, its head a grotesque mix of human and animal, all teeth and gleaming yellow eyes. Its breath washed over me in a fetid wave, a rotting meat smell that twisted my stomach. I fired, sheer panic outweighing precision. The creature roared, a bone-chilling sound that made the ground beneath me tremble. It stumbled but didn't go down. I fired again, and then it was on me, claws raking across my arm. Pain exploded, white-hot agony that made me scream. Through a haze of pain and terror, I saw the others' rifles raised. They fired a desperate volley of shots. The creature let out another roar, swiped a massive paw at them, then vanished into the trees with shocking speed. They found me near an old, gnarled redwood, half delirious and bleeding profusely. The emergency evac was a blur, and I have only fragmented memories of the hospital's sterile white walls, concerned faces hovering over me, and the constant throbbing pain where my left arm used to be. My name is Maya Walker, and this happened to me in August of 2019. Love being a ranger in Sequoia National Park. Those giant trees, something about them makes you feel small and a part of something ancient all at once. I'm usually with a crew, but today I'm on solo patrol. Nothing out of the ordinary. Just checking on campsites, trail conditions, the usual. Late afternoon, I'm about three miles into the Redwood Canyon Trail. It's getting towards that magic hour when the sunlight filters through the canopy and sets the whole forest aglow. I should be turning around soon, but something catches my attention. Off the trail, tucked behind some ferns, is a backpack. Looks new, fancy brand. Probably a day hiker who wandered off, maybe got turned around. Happens all the time. I radio it in and start looking for other stuff left behind. Gear strewn about would be a sign of trouble. I find nothing else for a good ten-yard radius. Weird, but no big deal. I'm about to give up when a flash of color catches my eye. It's a stuffed toy, a plush rabbit with one ear missing. I kneel down, pick it up. It's damp, like it's been out here a while, but otherwise seems fine. I give it a little squeeze, the kind of mindless thing you do when holding a kid's toy. A shiver runs down my spine. Something feels... off. It hits me then. This isn't just some lost toy. There's a sick familiarity about it, like something dredged up from a half-remembered nightmare. The missing ear, 
the dampness, like it's been clutched in a sweaty, terrified little fist. I shake my head, try to clear the sudden, unwelcome wave of dread. It's ridiculous. Suddenly, I hear a snap behind me. I whirl around, heart pounding. Across a small clearing, maybe twenty feet away, it's watching me. The first impression is one of size. It's huge, towering over my six-foot frame. Long, unnaturally spindly limbs tipped with claws like steak knives and thick, dark, ragged fur covering its body. The head is the worst part, a twisted canine snout, all teeth and predatory eyes glowing a dull yellow in the waning light. A strangled noise escapes my throat and it lunges, silent and incredibly fast for something its size. I barely dodge the first swipe, stumbling back and fumbling for my sidearm. The thing moves at blurring speed, a whirlwind of claws and gnashing teeth. I fire, more out of a panicked instinct than any real aim. The bullet strikes the creature and it roars, a bone-chilling shriek of pain and fury that echoes through the trees. I'm scrambling back, trying to find something to put between me and the monstrous thing. I fire again and again, the reports of the gun deafening in the quiet of the forest. The shots seem to be having an effect, slowing it down, causing it to flinch. It snarls, a guttural sound that vibrates through my whole body, revealing rows of teeth like jagged shards of glass flecked with blood. My blood? I can't tell. There's an acrid, foul smell in the air, something metallic and rotten. My shots have hit it, wounded it, but they haven't stopped it. It's insane. Nothing I've ever trained for prepares you for something like this. I'm nearly out of ammo. My breaths come in ragged gasps. Every muscle in my body screams with exertion, and every instinct is screaming to run. But there's nowhere to run. No safety. Only the trees, casting long shadows. The undergrowth hiding endless threats. And those glowing eyes tracking my every move. And then it does the unexpected. It hesitates. The guttural noises fade, its ragged breaths slow. Those glowing eyes fix on me, then flick towards the direction I came from, the direction of the trailhead, and civilization. Slowly it backs up a step, then another. It doesn't turn, keeping its eyes locked on me as it retreats into the shadows. A sliver of hope ignites in me. Is it retreating? Is it over? For a frozen moment, nothing happens. Just me, the creature in the shadows, and the oppressive silence of the redwood forest. Then, with a final low growl that seems to shake the ancient trees themselves, it turns and vanishes into the deepening gloom. I don't know how long I stand there, my body still locked in fight or flight. My gun hand is numb. Distantly, I hear voices and the crunch of footsteps approaching. Backup has arrived, called in by my garbled, incoherent report once I got through the shock enough to radio. They find the rabbit, the blood-splattered clearing marked with monstrous tracks, the shredded trees bearing the marks of impossibly powerful claws. And they find me, shaking like a leaf, mumbling over and over some garbled nonsense about yellow eyes and a missing ear. They put it down to bear attack, mauling by a rogue coyote, anything to fit the unimaginable into familiar boxes. The official statements speak of heightened vigilance, trail closures. I hear the whispers, the sidelong glances from my fellow rangers, the well-meaning but awkward offers of counseling. It wasn't a bear, not a coyote. I know what I saw, but I also know what happens when the impossible becomes real. The months that follow are a blur. Mandatory leave turns into a fog of sleepless nights of waking in a cold sweat at the phantom sound of claws scraping against my windowpane. I see those glowing eyes in every shadow, smell that rotting meat stench every time the wind rustles the leaves. I jump at every creak of the floorboards in my tiny cabin. I try to convince myself it's over, that the creature moved on. But deep down, I know it's out there. Sometimes, late at night, I imagine I can hear it pad silently through the trees near my cabin, its low growl echoing in the forest silence. And always, at the edge of my awareness, there's the lingering question, the horrifying possibility. Did it retreat that day because it found a better hunting ground? The turning point comes six months after the attack. A routine newspaper scan morbid curiosity masquerading as normalcy hits me with the force of a physical blow. 
small headline buried in the local section. Missing Child Sequoia National Park. The picture shows a smiling girl about nine years old with a one-eared stuffed rabbit clutched in her hand. The rabbit looks sickeningly familiar. That's when I make my decision. It's a gamble, a desperate one. But I can't stay, can't pretend anymore. I have to find it. If it's hunting humans now, if it's taking children, I can't live with the guilt that I could have done something and did nothing. The thought of another family torn apart, another life lost to those glowing eyes, is a chilling absolution. It releases a kind of twisted energy within me. I spend weeks preparing, my ranger training kicking in, but with a dark new focus. The gear I pack is a strange mix of the official and the unofficial trail maps, high-powered rifle, night vision goggles, and a hunting knife forged by a local survivalist who looked at me with a strange mix of skepticism and something like understanding. Before I leave, I write it all down. Not some rambling, incoherent rant, but a meticulously detailed account of that day, descriptions of the creature, its behavior patterns, potential weak spots. I seal the envelope and leave it addressed to my old partner Jonas, the one ranger who seems to have a flicker of doubt in his eyes when I speak of the attack. If I don't come back, he'll know what to do, if he has the courage. The Redwood Canyon Trail is ominously quiet when I step foot on it. The air feels heavy, expectant. I walk for hours, senses on high alert. The silence is the worst, broken only by the pounding of my own heart and an increasingly oppressive feeling of being watched. I find tracks, prints so large they would dwarf even a grizzly's paw. The sight of the shredded bark where I battled the creature sends a jolt of terror through me, but I force myself forward. Hours turn into what feels like days. The familiar trail becomes a maze of looming redwoods and treacherous ravines. Exhaustion gnaws at me like a feral thing, but I push on. I've become the prey now, driven by a desperate, fragile hope that I can become the hunter once again. I sleep on the forest floor, fitful snatches between periods of hyper-vigilant wakefulness. Every rustle, every snap of a twig sends adrenaline jolting through my veins. On the third night, I see it again. A flash of movement in my peripheral vision, the flicker of those terrible eyes in the darkness. Fear battles with a grim determination. I won't cower. I'll force the confrontation, end this nightmare, one way or another. With a silent prayer, I track it. The hunt is on. We move in a deadly game of hide-and-seek through the ancient forest. The creature is cunning. It circles back, tests my defenses, toys with me. But the little girl's face, the memory of that ragged rabbit, fuels my every move. Finally, it happens. I round a bend and nearly collide with it. No escape this time. The moon casts an eerie glow, enough for me to aim the rifle with trembling hands. I fire, and fire again. The creature roars, the sound primal and deafening. It's wounded, but it charges impossibly fast. I drop the rifle and lunge for the hunting knife. I'm no match for its strength. It knocks me aside, sending me sprawling against the unforgiving ground. I see the gleam of ivory teeth, taste the foulness of its breath, and brace for the crushing blow that will end it all. The blow doesn't come. Suddenly a blur of movement explodes out of the darkness. Gunfire echoes through the night. The creature lets out a shriek. A different sound this time, laced with shock and confused pain. It stumbles, turns, and flees into the undergrowth with surprising speed. Scrambling to my feet, I see another figure standing in the dappled moonlight. It's Jonas, face set in grim determination rifle still raised. A sob catches in my throat. It's over. It's really over. The aftermath is a mess of law enforcement, park closures, and half-baked cover stories. The mutilated corpses they find scattered throughout the forest don't fit any conventional narrative, but the official statements speak of everything but the truth. Jonas and I, we tell them what we can, knowing we will never be fully believed. We share a burden now, a dark secret that binds us and sets us apart from our fellow rangers. Sequoia still holds the same ancient magic, but it's forever tainted by the lurking darkness I unveiled. We go back to our jobs, back to patrolling the trails. We keep silent watch. They may dismiss the monstrous, but we know. 
we saw the truth in the glowing yellow eyes, the bloody fur, and the ragged one-eared rabbit clutched in a skeletal hand found deep in the redwood wilds. Sometimes, in the heavy silence before dawn, I feel a chill crawl down my spine, an echo of those inhuman eyes on my skin, an imagined whisper from the impenetrable darkness. But then Jonas will appear, stepping out of the mist like a silent sentinel, sharing a burdened glance. And in that silent exchange, there's a flicker of defiant hope. We are the guardians now, the keepers of the monstrous secret, the last line of defense against the shadows that haunt the Redwood Canyon. My name is Jonah Brooks, and this happened to me in August of 2008. I'm a ranger in Yellowstone National Park. Love the wide open spaces, the geysers, well, most of the time. See, Yellowstone's got this pristine beauty plastered over the fact it's an active volcano, and sometimes you get a reminder that nature here ain't about making us feel comfy. That August was a bad year for wildfires. We had a crew deployed in the backcountry, dealing with one that was getting close to a remote campground near Yellowstone Lake. Routine thing, usually. I was running logistics, supply deliveries, that sort of thing. But that morning, as I was checking inventory, something felt... off. It wasn't the smoke hanging heavy in the air. Wasn't even the distant roar of the fire. It was a prickle at the back of my neck. That same animal instinct that saved my hide more than once. I radioed into the crew, asked how things were looking voice came back stressed, choppy. Brooks, this ain't normal fire behavior. Wind's wrong, it's jumping. Then static broke the transmission. Couldn't settle after that. Told my supervisor I was taking a truck out, check the situation myself. He grumbled about regulations and liability, but after enough badgering, relented. Figured best case I'd calm a rattled crew and get back before dark. Worst case, well, I wasn't the type to leave folks hanging, wildfire or not. It's slow going through burn zones. Charred timber, fallen trees, ground still smoking in places. I passed abandoned firefighting equipment in a rush, confirming what the guys on the radio hinted. They'd pulled out fast. Something was spooking them. Tension ratcheted in my gut, but I kept going. Finally reached the perimeter of the campground, saw where the line in the trees marked the fire's advance, and saw the footprints. Now I know wildlife seen my share of bear and elk tracks. These weren't like anything in the guidebook. Huge, misshapen, no claw marks. My pulse pounded in my ears. That same word echoed in my head, unbidden. Wrongness. I grabbed my rifle from the truck, more for comfort than any real expectation of needing it. Pushed through the undergrowth and into the campground, and that's when I saw the bodies. Well, what was left of them? Campers caught off guard. It wasn't fire that killed them. This was something precise. Cruel. Torn limbs, shattered bones, and blood. So much blood. I don't scare easy, but I retched right there, bile rising in my throat. Then I heard it, a rustling from deeper in the trees. Adrenaline overrode nausea. I leveled my rifle, scanning the shadows. Saw movement, a flash of something pale and unnaturally large. Then it was gone. Whatever did this, it was smart. Knew it was outnumbered by the crew. And now it was hunting me. I backpedaled, trying to find a clear line of sight, a defensible position. But those woods, choked with smoke and half-burned trees, they were a maze. Tripped over a fallen log, scrambled up, and that's when I saw it fully. Not an animal, not exactly. It moved on two legs, hunched over, but those legs were too long, the joints all bent at strange angles. Its skin, God, the skin was translucent, stretched tight over bulging veins and sinew, and the head, small, skull-like, with eyes that were just pits of shadow. It tilted that head, almost like a bird, studying me. The damn thing was intelligent. That was worse than any monstrous size or claws. I raised my rifle, finger trembling on the trigger, Fired one shot, then another, and it flinched but kept coming. This close I could smell it, something rotten, like meat left too long in the sun, mixed with an acrid chemical stink. 
It lunged and I fell back, its inhuman hands raking across my chest, tearing at my clothes. Blind luck. I rolled to the side, dodging another swipe, scrambled for the fallen rifle just as that clawed hand reached for my throat. I got a shot off, point blank. The recoil slammed into my shoulder, the sound deafening in the enclosed space. The thing shrieked, a noise like nails on a chalkboard, and stumbled back. I didn't stick around to see if I killed it. Ran like hell, lungs burning, legs scraped raw from scrambling through the undergrowth. Burst out of the tree line, nearly plowed into a truck. It was the rest of the firefighting crew coming back in force. They took one look at my wild eyes and bloody clothes and no one asked questions. We stormed the campsite guns drawn, expecting a firefight with... with whatever that thing was. Found nothing. No corpse, no blood trail, nothing but the gruesome remains the campers and that lingering rotten stench. The crew leader, a grizzled old-timer named Hank, gave me a long, hard look. You see it, Brooks? I nodded, unable to speak. Hank sighed. Me neither, son. But sometimes, best thing to do is forget. Fire can clean a lot of sins, and this mess... He gestured around at the carnage. This is something the higher-ups don't need to know about. And they didn't. Official report was tragic accident. Wildfire victims. The crew kept our mouths shut. What else could we do? Tell them about the monster in the smoke and get ourselves locked up in the psych ward. But sometimes, sometimes I hear that shriek again, echoing in my nightmares. Sometimes I smell that rot, that chemical burn, on the wind, and I start checking the tree line, rifle at the ready. And sometimes I think about Hank's words, about fire-cleansing sins, and I wonder if that thing ever truly left those woods. Wonder if one day the smoke will clear, and we'll all be forced to see. I was never the same after that. Edgy, jumpy. Couldn't be alone in the woods without my gun practically glued to my hand. My fiancé, bless her soul, stuck by me, tried dragging me to therapy sessions with no luck. I just wasn't ready to talk about the face in the smoke, not to some shrink who wouldn't believe anyway. But here's the thing about fear. It's like a hungry animal. You feed it, it gets stronger. You starve it, maybe, just maybe, it starts to wither. I chose to starve it forced myself back into the woods, took every remote trail assignment, every firewatch shift I could get my hands on, figured best way to face down a monster was to show it I wasn't afraid. That didn't exactly work out the way I hoped. Never saw the creature again, not in full form anyway. But those woods, they felt different. The wildlife got skittish, their usual calls and rustlings replaced by an unnatural silence. Even the smoke from the burn zone seemed colder, heavier, Tourists started reporting weird stuff, too. Figures sighted on the ridges just out of view. A sense of being watched followed. Reports got dismissed as misidentification or campfire tales spun out of control. Me? I knew what those folks saw. Knew that maybe I wasn't the only one facing my demons. That the damn thing was pushing outward, testing its boundaries. It was two years later, during a freak blizzard, when the next piece fell into place. Dispatch called, panicked voice crackling over the radio. Missing hiker, a kid on a winter backpacking trip with his school group. Got separated during the storm, likely somewhere in the backcountry near the park boundaries. I didn't even think, just suited up and took a snowmobile out into the heart of that whiteout. Knew where I needed to go. A small, isolated patch of forest that the fire years earlier somehow hadn't touched. The epicenter of that wrongness the place where I swore that thing had crawled back into the earth. The kid wasn't there, of course. No tracks in the fresh snow except the long, misshapen ones I knew too well. I followed them anyway, the blizzard swirling around me as I descended into the choked heart of that untouched forest. And that's when I found the cave, hidden beneath the roots of an ancient pine, a yawning, dark maw in the frozen earth. That familiar stench drifted out, making my stomach turn, Knew I shouldn't. Knew it was insane, but something pulled me forward. Gun in one hand, flashlight in the other, I went down into that darkness. The cave stank of rot and something distinctly metallic. The ground sloped downward, the narrow tunnel forcing me to crouch, then crawl. My flashlight beam cut into the blackness with shaky slices. Something was down here, could feel it like a prickle against my skin. 
Then I saw footprints in the damp earth, human, child-sized, fresh. Followed them, my own ragged breaths echoing back at me as the tunnel seemed to tighten, to close in around my shoulders. Finally, it opened into a wider chamber. Flashlight beam danced across the walls, and my blood ran cold. They weren't cave walls at all. No rock or earth, but a sickening, translucent flesh stretched taut over a framework of gnarled bone. The cave was alive. In the center of that chamber was the kid. Asleep, curled in a fetal position, his backpack discarded nearby. And next to him, hunched in the shadows, was the creature. Its skin had lost even more of its pigment, becoming so thin I could see the pulse of its overlarge heart, the slow churn of its digestive system. It was starving, and the kid, he was its prey, stored for later. My breath hitched in my throat, but I knew I couldn't fire. Too risky, and a gunshot might make that fleshy ceiling collapse on all of us. Instead, I inched closer, footsteps silent on the soft, damp ground. Had a plan insane as it was. My lighter flicked to life, a tiny flame against the monstrous darkness. I touched it to the wall, the thing closest to flesh I could find. There's no sound quite like a living thing burning. The creature screamed, its shriek piercing the stagnant air. It thrashed, ripping at its own burning skin, forgetting all about the sleeping child. And the walls, they spasmed, contracting in on themselves like the death throes of some obscene, colossal worm. I grabbed the kid and ran. The cave was collapsing, chunks of fleshy tissue and shards of bone raining down. Burst out into the fresh air, dragging him into the swirling snow, just as the whole rotten structure caved in with a roar that rattled the trees. Aftermath. That was the end of it, or as close to an ending as a living nightmare gets. Kid was okay just some mild hypothermia. I claimed I found him wandered off during the storm, never mentioned the cave, the creature. But I resigned from the park service soon after. Couldn't shake the image of those pulsating walls, the way the ground had writhed beneath my feet. The knowledge that there's places in this world where even nature is corrupted, warped into something wrong. Sometimes, mostly at night when the wind howls like a wounded beast, I imagine that cave is still down there. Maybe it collapsed for good, crushing whatever made it into oblivion. Or maybe it lays dormant, regenerating, waiting for when the earth shifts, the trees grow back, and some other poor soul stumbles across its hidden entrance. They say Yellowstone sits on a sleeping beast, a volcano waiting to erupt. I wouldn't be surprised if there's other beasts lurking deep beneath, ones fueled not by fire but a more ancient sort of hunger. And we walk on the thin crust above, never knowing when it might crack open under our feet. My name is Lucas Novak, and this happened to me in September of 2010. I've been with the NPS for eight years now, all of them at Olympic National Park. It's a special kind of place. Rainforest, ocean, mountains, the works. You see things out here you won't see anywhere else. Some good, some not so much. I should back up. I love being a ranger. The fresh air, the solitude, most of the time anyway. Helps clear my head after all the time I spend in the army. Yeah, that kind of cliche. The quiet out here is what drew me in, but like the saying goes, be careful what you wish for. Sometimes the quiet can bite back. It started with my partner, Jenna. Great ranger even if she was fresh out of training and still a bit by the book. We were patrolling the Seven Lakes Basin Loop, a moderate hike popular with day trippers during the warmer months. Even in September, the weather can be iffy sunshine one minute, downpour the next. Not that it stopped the tourists. We were nearing the end of the trail when a couple flagged us down. They looked shaken. The woman was close to tears. They said Jenna's name, that another ranger sent them to find us. Jenna and I exchanged a puzzled look. No other patrols were scheduled in this area today. The couple said there was a man, well, a creature, they corrected themselves, hunched over something in a clearing just ahead. They said it moved fast and it didn't look right. Jenna and I told them to stay calm, said we'd investigate, 
probably a bear or maybe a delusional hiker. Standard protocol, calm the witnesses, check out the situation, make a report. We moved quickly but quietly, guns drawn. I've seen enough weird stuff in the woods these days that I don't discount anything right away anymore. But as we approached the clearing, I couldn't shake that cold, primal feeling that something was seriously wrong. The thing was crouched low to the ground, its back to us, and it was definitely not a bear. It was humanoid, but too tall, limbs like gnarled branches, hunched in an impossibly unnatural way. Its skin looked like old, cracked leather stretched painfully tight over the bones. Worst of all, there was something stuck into its back. Jenna's bright orange patrol jacket, the one with Ranger printed on it in big, bold letters. My stomach turned. I glanced at Jenna. She was pale, mouth set in a grim line. I started to mouth her name, but the creature whipped around, flinging Jenna's jacket aside. God, the face. Mostly a skull, yellow teeth set in elongated jaws, and eyes like pits of pure darkness. It let out a hissing shriek that made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Adrenaline kicked in and I yelled for the couple to run. Shots rang out. I was firing, Jenna was firing, but the thing was just too damn fast. It charged, dodging our bullets and bounding into the trees with unsettling speed. The couple was gone. We could search for them later, but right now, my partner was down. I raced to Jenna's side, dropping to my knees beside her. It was bad. Deep gashes across her torso, blood pooling beneath her. Her breath came in ragged gasps. Lucas! It... it... Her voice was choked, and then her eyes rolled back. My mind was racing. I fumbled for my radio, voice shaking as I called in a 1033. Emergency officer down. While I waited for backup, I tried to stabilize Jenna, but the wounds were too severe. Her eyes fluttered open for the last time. A weak smile crossed her face. Then she was gone. Just like that. Backup arrived within 20 minutes. Felt like an eternity to me. EMTs, more rangers, the whole response team. Then a chopper airlifted Jenna's body out. I wasn't allowed to go with her. Procedure. They told me to stay with the investigating team, give my statement. They scoured those woods for the creature, or evidence of it. Found nothing. Of course they didn't. I explained in excruciating detail what I'd seen. The appearance, the way it moved. They gave me those patient, sympathetic nods, and I could see in their eyes that nobody believed me. Not really. The official report ruled Jenna's death a cougar attack, despite the wounds being completely inconsistent with any known predator. My protests didn't amount to much. Her family got a closed casket funeral and the NPS offered a hefty settlement to keep things quiet. Standard procedure by now. The worst part is I know I'm not alone. Hikers reported similar sightings. Tall, skeletal thing, blazing eyes, moving like nothing they'd ever seen. But the reports always get suppressed explained away. Rangers who try to dig deeper either get transferred or disappear, like those missing hikers they never find. I considered quitting after Jenna died, thought I was going crazy, that grief had broken me. But then I got stubborn. Screw them. If the Park Service won't do their damn job and protect people, then I will. I started keeping my own records, separate from the official ones. Detailed descriptions, patrol areas, dates of sightings, I reached out to those few rangers who I sensed actually believed, formed a kind of unofficial back-channel network. I even made careful inquiries in old Native American records held at reservations nearby. Some of the stories sent chills down my spine. Similar creatures have been whispered about for centuries, dismissed as folktales or campfire stories. The thing is, those stories don't just speak of fear. Some talk of strength, of old magic that the land still holds. A way to maybe understand these creatures, not as monsters, but as something other. If I could find the right lore, the right ritual, maybe there's a way to stop this. To protect hikers. To avenge Jenna. Hell, if the NPS won't give me a gun for this, I'll figure out how to make a damn spear. Years passed. Each new sighting fueled my obsession, a constant burning reminder of what I'd lost and what was still out there. I became a ghost, haunting the woods, a creature of rumor more than a man. Some of my ranger colleagues were onto me, giving me wide berth or outright avoiding me. The rest just assumed I'd cracked under the pressure. 
They weren't entirely wrong. I spent my leaves off park grounds, poring over crumbling texts in reservation libraries, seeking out elders who might be willing to divulge the old stories. It was a slow, frustrating process, fraught with skepticism and dead ends. But slowly, a picture began to emerge, a twisted tapestry of half-remembered legends and fragmented mythologies. The creature, the rake, as those unlucky enough to encounter it named it, wasn't just some mutated predator or cryptid. It was something far older, a spirit of hunger and wildness woven into the very fabric of this place. One elder, a Maka woman whose wrinkled face bore the weight of a hundred winters, spoke of a ritual dance. It was a way, she said, of communicating with those who stalk the twilight between worlds, an offering to appease the ancient spirits slumbering beneath the earth. Dangerous, she warned, her voice low, a line easily crossed with grave consequences. Desperation gnawed at me. It felt like a gamble, maybe madness. But I couldn't live like this any longer, trapped in a cycle of grief and futile rage. Whatever the risk, I had to try. I chose Samhain, the old Celtic festival, when the veil between our world and what lies beyond grows thin, symbolically at least. But every bit of leverage counted, every scrap of folklore I might twist to my advantage. I chose a remote clearing deep within Olympic National Park, far from any established trails. I spent days setting up, creating the circle from precisely gathered stones, marking it with symbols gleaned from forgotten texts, building a carefully arranged fire pit. I even managed to find the right offerings, bitter herbs, rare feathers, even a drop of my own blood spilled onto a carefully chosen stone. Details mattered. Rituals, from what I'd learned, were a matter of precision, of intent made manifest. When that thin sliver of moon shone down on the eve of Samhain, I stood in the center of that circle, nerves taut with a mix of terror and grim determination. I began the dance. It wasn't graceful, not by any stretch. But the steps were precise, memorized through relentless practice. I chanted in a language I barely understood, the old words resonating through the cold night air. At first, nothing happened. Then the forest around me seemed to fall utterly silent, not even the rustle of leaves in the wind. Firelight cast warped shadows that writhed against the trees, and I swore the air was growing thicker, pressing against me with unseen weight. Then it appeared. The rake. Emerging from the darkness just beyond the circle. Each skeletal step seemed to shake the very ground, its burning eyes fixed on me, and for a sickening moment, I feared I'd made a catastrophic mistake. But I held my ground, forcing myself to keep dancing. My voice cracked as I finished the chant and fell into a desperate, breathless silence. A hissing whisper echoed on the wind, a language that prickled my spine with its inhuman tones. I didn't understand the words, but the intent behind them was clear. Hunger, cold and sharp as a blade. A test. A challenge issued from the yawning dark. It lunged. I barely dodged, the rake's elongated claws ripping through the air where I'd stood just a second before. Pain exploded across my chest. I staggered back, hand coming away slick with blood. I moved. Not with the steps of the ritual, but with the desperation of a cornered animal. Seizing a burning branch from the fire, I thrust it towards the creature like a makeshift spear. It shrieked. Recoiling from the flames, its leathery skin sizzling where embers landed. And then, a shift. The raw hunger in its eyes dimmed, replaced by something calculating and cold. The rake let out a guttural sound, almost a snarl, then melted back into the shadows, vanishing with impossible speed. I crumpled to my knees, the clearing suddenly silent. Gasping for breath, I clutched at my wounded chest. I was alive. Had I... I spent the rest of that night in a shivering daze tending to the wound. It stung, but was superficial. As dawn broke, I stumbled out of the clearing, leaving the ravaged circle behind. Back at my cabin, sleep was impossible. Had the ritual worked? Had I actually driven the creature away, or just enraged it further? Or maybe, and this was the most unsettling thought, had I made some kind of unholy bargain with it? The old stories warned of such dangers. Days turned into weeks. 
There were no more rake sightings near the ritual site. A small victory, maybe? But my network of ranger contacts buzzed with increased reports from other parts of the park. It was as if by confronting it, I'd simply caused it to shift its hunting grounds. Guilt gnawed at me. Had I made things worse? The tragic aftermath came unexpectedly. On a crisp autumn afternoon, two hikers stumbled out of the woods, faces etched with terror. They'd been on a remote trail miles from where I'd performed the ritual. They babbled about an attack, describing the rake with chilling clarity. And... One more horrific detail. The hikers had found another ranger, or what was left of her. Jenna's badge was pinned to a tattered scrap of uniform smeared with blood, hanging from a low branch. My world shattered. Not just grief, but the crushing weight of failure. All my research, the desperate ritual, it hadn't been enough. The rake couldn't be appeased, couldn't be reasoned with. It was a force of nature as unyielding and unstoppable as a storm. I went rogue after that, left the park service, vanished into the wilderness I'd once called home. I still hunt the rake. Each sighting is a fresh wound. I'm armed to the teeth. My service pistol, hunting rifle, even a machete, honed razor sharp. I've gotten better at tracking it, anticipating its movements. I've even managed to scare it off a few times, protecting hikers who would have fallen victim to its claws. But I won't stop until it's dead, or until I am. Sometimes, in the quiet moments, which are increasingly rare, I wonder if this is what Jenna would have wanted. This path of vengeance and almost certain doom. Or would she have preferred I walk away, try to mend what was left of my life? There's no going back now, no answers to those questions. Only the hunt and the endless echo of those terrible, burning eyes in my nightmares. <laughs>